All right. So welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope everyone out there is staying safe and healthy. I'm wishing everybody well. And with that said, let's uh, get into a new chapter here. We're moving to chapter nine of the textbook. So we are jumping ahead a few chapters and going out of sequence to cover the next topic, which is momentum. And um, before we jump into the lecture, I'd just like to say that the format is slightly different. Um, I have no access to campus anymore, so I can't actually go to the lecture room on campus and film videos anymore. I'll be filming everything uh, from my own home. But basically, it's going to be the same thing you're used to. We're, we're going to go through these slides, and then we're, we'll work out the problems uh, on the board. Okay, so uh, that's how this will go from here on out. And to get into this topic of momentum, why don't we just define what momentum is, uh, both conceptually and with an equation. So conceptually, we tend to think of momentum as a measure, some number that tells you how difficult it would be to bring an object to a stop. So if, if an object has a lot of momentum, it's quite difficult to bring it to a stop. And if it has very little momentum, then it's pretty easy to bring that object to a stop. And there's an equation for this. Uh, the momentum of an object is just defined as its mass times its velocity. So momentum is given by lowercase p, and it's a vector, so we put a little arrow on top of the p. p is equal to m times v, where m is the mass and v is the velocity. Now we have a new sort of quantity here, which means we have a new unit to measure it in, but the SI unit is just kilograms for mass and meters per second for velocity. So we have a kilogram times a meter per second. That is how we measure momentum. Now, the momentum of a single object is just mass times velocity. Oftentimes, we have a whole bunch of objects together, and we want to know what the total momentum of all of those objects is. Well, the way you handle this situation is pretty simple. If you want to know the total momentum of a whole group of objects, you just add their momentum vectors together. So that would be P1 plus P2 plus P3, and then just keep doing that as long as you've... Uh, accounted for all of the objects. So that would be m1 times v1 plus m2 times v2 plus m3 times v3 and so on. Again, we're just adding up all the individual momentum vectors of all the different objects. That gives us the total momentum. And it really bears repeating that uh, momentum is a vector. It has a magnitude and a direction. So when we add up momentum in this way, it's vector addition that we're doing. We're not just adding up numbers we're adding up vectors, okay? So let's get a little practice with this idea of momentum uh, just by making a couple quick estimates. Um, the first question here says, estimate the momentum of your momentum when you're running at full speed in units of kilograms uh, times meters per second. The next question says, estimate the magnitude of your car's momentum when you're driving down the highway in units of kilograms uh, meters per second. So Pause the video at this point, um, think about this for a second, come up with some calculations for these two momentum values, and then we'll uh, go over it together. Okay, so in this example, we are going to estimate the momentum of some everyday objects. The first one is a person running at full speed. So to remind you, the definition of momentum is P equals M times V. That's uh, momentum is equal to mass times velocity. And if we want to figure out what the magnitude of an object's momentum is, okay, we want to take the magnitude of this vector P, that's simply taking the mass times the magnitude of vector V, which is the speed. We take the magnitude of the velocity, we get the speed. Okay, so basically, in these two examples, we have to think about what the mass of the object is, and what the speed of the object is. So let's do the person running at full speed first. Okay, so for this, everyone is going to select a different mass um, because the mass of a human obviously changes depending on who you're talking about. But for me, I'll take the mass to be, I don't know, 85 kilograms. And for the speed, Let's take about six meters per second. Now, 
just to give you some sense, uh, Usain Bolt, the fastest person in the world, I think his top speed is around 10 meters per second. So I'm going to give myself a little credit and say I can just do about half that or a little more than half that. Okay. So the magnitude of uh, uh, the momentum of a person running at full speed, therefore, is just 85 kilograms multiplied by 6 meters per second, which gives us, if you do the multiplication, uh, about 510 kilograms, meters per second. So you should be getting a couple hundred, uh, again, depending on what numbers you used here. Okay, so the next thing is a car driving down the highway. And again, answers will vary here because uh, it depends on what mass and speed you chose. But the mass of a typical sedan is probably around 1,500 kilograms, whereas the speed that you'll be going, assuming you're uh, following the speed limit, is roughly uh, 30 meters per second. Okay, that corresponds to a little, a little over 60 miles per hour. Okay, so um, the magnitude of the momentum of this object is therefore going to be 1,500 kilograms times 300, sorry, 30, not 300, 30 meters per second. And what you do when you make the multiplication is you get uh, 45,000 kilograms meters per second. So as expected, the uh, car driving down the highway has a much larger momentum than a person running at full speed. Again, momentum is sort of a measure of how difficult it would be to bring each of these things to a stop. So much more momentum for the uh, car. All right, so that was a brief introduction to momentum, just defining what it is. The next thing we want to talk about is why momentum is actually a useful quantity. It turns out momentum is related to force in a really uh, fundamental way. So let's talk about the relationship between momentum and force. Okay, so what I want to show you here is that Newton's second law, um, something we've been working with for a very long time, we're used to seeing this as F is equal to MA, can be written in a different way in terms of momentum. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, equation here. This says that we can have a more general version of Newton's second law by saying the net force on the left-hand side is equal to dP dt, where that's a derivative of momentum with respect to time or the time rate of change of momentum. In other words, the net force acting on an object has to do with the way the momentum is changing. That's the way you want to interpret this equation. And I am going to get into a little bit of calculus here, but uh, again, the important thing is just to understand the end result and the takeaway point. Um, let's go through what this equation implies. So, so first, let's just remember what the definition of momentum is. When we see P in this equation at the top of the screen, well, we know that's given by mass times velocity, or m times v. So why don't we just make that substitution uh, where we see the momentum for mass times velocity? So now what this says is the net force acting on an object is the derivative of mass times velocity. It's the time rate of change of mass times velocity. And so we need to know how to evaluate this derivative. And if you've taken calculus, you'll know that when we have two things multiplied together, like mass times velocity, and you want to take the derivative of that, uh, you use something called the product rule to evaluate that derivative. And this is how it works. You take the derivative of the first term, which is dm dt, and then multiply by the second term, which is just v. Then you add to that the first term, which is just m, and then you multiply that by the derivative of the second term, which is dv by dt. And that's how you evaluate the derivative of momentum, if you think of that as being mass times velocity. So the thing is, in the first term on the right-hand side of the equation, we have dm dt, which is the time rate of change of mass. Well, typically, we're dealing with an object whose mass isn't changing, right? If we're thinking about a car driving down the highway or a person running, their mass is not something that changes, it's just a constant. Uh, 
So that means the derivative of mass with respect to time, or the time rate of change of mass, is zero. So in that first term, we can just put zero for uh, dm dt. And now what we're left with is the net force acting on an object is equal to mass times dv dt. But the next thing we should do is just remember that dv dt is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. And that's just the definition of acceleration. That's what acceleration really is. It's the time rate of change of velocity. So in the end, you can rewrite this as the net force acting on an object is m times a. So, so what did we show? We can think of Newton's second law in terms of momentum, and it's completely equivalent to f equals ma, which is something we've seen before. Okay? So that's how momentum is related to force. And this next result, um, I'm not going to go into the derivation here. If you take physics 45 and we get a little bit deeper into the calculus concepts, you'll see a full derivation of this. But for now, I'm just going to state the result and try to make it uh, easy to understand conceptually. So first, let's talk about something called impulse. Okay? Impulse is defined as the change in an object's momentum. So when we, whenever we refer to a change in physics, we use the delta symbol. So since we're talking about change in momentum, that is delta p. So how do we think about delta p? It's p final minus p initial. It's the final momentum minus the initial momentum. That gives you the change in an object's momentum. And again, it bears repeating that this is a vector quantity. Okay, so let's think about how could we possibly change the momentum of an object? In other words, how could we deliver an impulse to an object? Well, the answer is you need to apply a force to it. You want to get its uh, motion to change, you need to apply a force. And, well, the greater the force you apply, it stands to reason that the greater the uh, change in momentum you'll give it. But also, if you apply the force for a longer amount of time, uh, that also will uh, influence the change in momentum, right? So the idea is the greater the force, the greater the impulse will deliver, but also the longer the force acts, the greater the impulse that will deliver. And the result is right there at the bottom of the screen. Delta P is equal to F average times delta T. So how do we interpret this equation? It says that the impulse that's delivered to an object, that's delta P, is equal to the average force that acts on that object times the amount of time it takes for that force to actually act. Okay? Um, so again, I'm not going to really go through the derivation of this. Uh, that'll come later in physics 45. But hopefully you understand the concept here. And the next thing we'll do is get into a couple examples of how you can use this. So the, the simplest one we'll look at is right here. Um, this is average force example number one. Let's say I have a 125 gram ball that's thrown at a wall and it bounces back in the opposite direction as shown in the diagram below. So the speed of the ball is 12 meters per second just before it hits the wall and it's 12 meters per second just after. So it doesn't lose any speed bouncing off. The wall is in con uh, sorry, the ball is in contact with the wall for 12 milliseconds. The question is, what is the impulse that the wall imparts onto the ball during the collision? What is the average force that the wall exerts on the ball is the second question. Okay, so if we think about what's going on here, the, the ball is coming in, moving to the right, and then it leaves moving to the left. There's definitely an impulse there. There's a change in momentum because the object has completely reversed its direction of motion. So we know there's some kind of delta P going on there. And according to our uh, result on the previous slide, we know this implies that there's some kind of force that the um, ball is exerting on the wall. So we can actually calculate that, and so we'll do that right now. Okay, so in this next example, what we have is a ball which bounces off of a wall. Initially, the ball is moving straight to the right, so my V initial vector is pointing to the right as shown here. And then after it bounces off the wall, it moves in the exact opposite direction. So my V final vector is pointing to the left. So we have a couple questions <clears throat> uh, pertaining to this situation, which are, A, what is the impulse or the change in momentum 
uh, that occurs because of the ball's collision with the wall. So to calculate this, we're going to have delta P is equal to P final minus P initial. That's the change in momentum. And remember that momentum, generally speaking, can be thought of as mass times velocity. So my final momentum is mass times final velocity, whereas my initial momentum is mass times initial velocity. So you might be thinking, OK, well, the ball traveled at 12 meters per second uh, going into the wall, and it bounced back at 12 meters per second. So the difference is 0, but that's not right. We have to think of velocity as a vector. Okay, so the fact that the direction flipped is really important here. Okay, so the mass, well, that was uh, 125 grams or in kilograms, 0.125 kilograms. Okay, and that mass is actually a common factor here and here, so I can just pull that out. Now I just need to write V final minus V initial. So my final velocity is in the negative x direction. Okay. So it has a negative sign attached to it, negative 12.0 meters per second i hat. That's how I write this as a vector. I really need to think about this as a vector. My initial velocity, which I'm subtracting here, is positive 12.0 meters per second i hat. So just again, to, to recap, my initial velocity, which I'm subtracting here, is going to the right, so it's positive. My final velocity, which is right here, is negative because it's going to the left. So when we do this calculation, we find that we get something with a negative sign attached to it overall. And um, what we get is actually it just works out to minus 3 if you do this calculation. So minus 3 units are kilograms, meters per second. And because we're thinking of this as a vector, we need to put i hat indicating, again, the change in momentum is in the negative x direction. Now, why is this useful? Well, we can relate this to the force. So, so you can in understand intuitively that uh, there's actually a very big amount of force that the uh, wall has to exert on the ball because it's changing the motion of the ball really rapidly. A large force has to be involved in that kind of uh, situation. So previously we found that delta P is the average force times delta t. So if I want to get a handle on the average force, all I need to do is take f average is delta p divided by delta t. And this is our delta p from before, our change in momentum. So this is negative 3.00 kilograms. And then I have meters per second i hat, just uh, taking the delta p we found before. And then I'm dividing it by delta t. In the problem, we were given that this lasts for 12 milliseconds. So in other words, the ball is touching the wall for a total of 12 milliseconds. So a millisecond is 10 to the minus 3 seconds. The prefix milli is 10 to the minus 3. So this could be written as 12 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds. So it's a very short amount of time. Now. We make this calculation, and it does come out as a negative, and it's 2.50, 10 to the 2. What are we dealing with uh, unit-wise? Well, we have kilograms. We have meters per second squared, because I, now I have two factors of seconds on the bottom after dividing by seconds here. We should recognize that this unit of a kilogram meter per second squared is a newton. That's equivalent to a newton of force. And I forgot my i hat unit vector. What does that indicate? We're going in the negative x direction when it comes to this force. So what we would say about the force is it's 2.50, 10 to the 2 newtons. That's the magnitude of it. And which way is it going? Well, it's going away from the wall. And that should make sense, because if the ball is coming in towards the wall, and all of a sudden its motion changes, and now it's moving back away from the wall, there must be a really large force away from the wall to make that happen. And that's exactly what we see here. 250, uh, or 2.5, 10 to the 2 newtons of force is the answer.
All right, so here's a, another example. Um, it's pretty much the same idea, except the geometry of it is a little bit more complicated. So in this case, we have a rubber ball with a mass of 275 grams. And initially it's traveling horizontally with the speed of 12.5 meters per second. This ball hits a, uh, a tilted wooden board. And immediately after that, it moves off at a speed of 10.5 meters per second at an angle of 75 degrees from the horizontal. So it's the same set of questions. What is the impulse that the board delivers to the ball? So that's the change in momentum. And the second question is if the uh, ball is in contact with the board for 74.5 milliseconds, so that's how long the force is acting, um, what is that average force that it's feeling from the board? So for each one of these answers, we're going to give the magnitude and the direction. Okay, so let's work this one out. Okay, so the next example is pretty similar to the one we just did. Um, it involves a ball that's bouncing off of a surface and afterwards moves in a new direction. But in this case, initially, the object is moving straight to the right, uh, which is the x direction, and afterwards, it goes at an angle of 75 degrees relative to the x axis. So the, the types of calculations we're doing are the same as before. We want to get a sense of what delta p is, uh, first, what is the change in momentum that this thing undergoes as it bounces like this? So delta P is equal to, as always, P final minus P initial, which is equal to M V final minus M V initial. Okay, that's same as before. But now um, it's a little bit more uh, tricky to calculate this because the vectors uh, of initial and final momentum have both x and y components that we need to think about. So let's start by, on one line, writing down the vector mv final. So what's our mass here? We have a um, 275 gram or 0.275 kilogram ball. Now its final velocity has an x component, which is equal to if we write this uh, by component, remember the x component is the magnitude times cosine of this angle. The y component is the magnitude times sine of this angle. The magnitude for the final velocity we were given, that's the final speed, is 10.5 meters per second. So for the x component, we'll have 10.5 meters per second cosine of 75 degrees. So then that goes with the i-hat unit vector. And then for our y component, we're going to have... 10.5 meters per second, and then we'll have sine 75 degrees, and that goes with our j hat unit vector. That goes with our j hat unit vector. That is the vector in xy form. What we want to do is subtract mv initial. So the mass, just like before, is 0.275 kilograms. We're going to take that, multiply by v initial, and I'm going to, again, write this in xy component form. Now, the x component of v initial is just the magnitude of the vector. It's only in the x direction. There is no y component to it whatsoever. And it's initially moving at 12.5 meters per second. If I wanted to, I could think of the angle here as being 0 degrees and say cosine of 0, but the... Uh, result of that would just be to give you 12.5. In a similar way, I know the y component is zero. Again, I could have taken 12.5 sine of zero, but that just gives me zero, so that's what we have. Okay, so what I'm gonna get is the x component of delta p and the y component of delta p separately. For the x component, here's what I'm doing. I'm taking the mass, 0.275, times the speed final, 10.5 meters per second, times cosine of 75, and then I'm subtracting the mass, 0.275 times 12.5. So I have to do that whole um, operation, and at the end of the day, I'm going to get negative 2.69 uh, um, kilograms meters per second. Uh, technically, I'd want to keep three sig figs on that. Okay, now for my y component, I'm going to take the mass 0.275 kilograms times 10.5 meters per second times sine of 75 degrees, 
and then just subtract, well, zero. So just think about uh, the first y component, and that's it. And what you get is positive 2.789 kilograms meters per second. And I forgot to write i hat and j hat, so those are the x and y components. We were asked to find not delta p in x, y form, but instead we want to find it in a polar form. Um, that is a magnitude and a direction. So remember how this works. If I want to take the magnitude of a vector, let's say delta p, what I need to do is take the square root of the x component. So that would be delta p x squared. That's right here, by the way. Let's label it. That's delta p x plus delta p y squared. So again, this is just how you take the magnitude of any vector. We found the x and y components. There they are. So let's plug them in. What we get is the square root of minus 2.690. I'm going to leave off the units. We know they're kilograms, meters per second. Uh, I just don't have enough space to write that. Uh, but I want to square it. Um, then I'm going to take 2.789, again, leaving the units off and squaring that all under the radical. What we get is the magnitude of the vector, which comes out to about 3.8748. Um, We'd like to keep on that uh, three sig figs. And so we would round that to 3.87 kilograms meters per second. So that's the magnitude of the change in momentum that happens when this thing bounces off the board. Okay, the next thing is, um, let's remember how to get the angle of a vector if you know its x and y components. So we remember that tangent of the angle theta is equal to delta py over delta px. In other words, the tangent of the angle is just the y component divided by the x component of a vector. And then we're going to have to do the inverse tangent or the arc tangent to get an angle out. But let's also remember um, it matters which quadrant we're in when we do this. So if I had a negative x component and a positive y component, I'm in the second quadrant. So this is quadrant number two, which means when I um, do the inverse tangent, I should add 180 degrees to make the angle come out right. So I'll just write that out front, 180 degrees, because we're in quadrant two, plus the inverse tangent of the y component divided by the x component, which are as follows, 2.789 divided by negative 2.690. And here's what we get out of this. So you would be taking 180, and then what you would get out of the inverse tangent calculation is minus 46.04 degrees, which we're rounding this, by the way, because we keep three sig figs, we're rounding to one decimal place. So we should keep one decimal place when we subtract from 180 because 180 is an exact number. It's not, uh, it's not like we need to worry about the sig figs on 180. That's exact. But if we're keeping one decimal place after subtraction, um, this is what we get, 133.96 degrees. Okay, then I have to round to this decimal place where the nine is. And I would get uh, 134 because I'd have to round up and then just say 0. 0.0. So that's the angle off the X axis, meaning it's in the second quadrant going this way. All right, so the next part of this, since we've got delta P, um, and we have it in terms of a magnitude, which is right here, and a direction, which is right here. Now we're going to take those numbers and use them to calculate the average force during this uh, bounce. Okay, so I'm going to have to erase this. So we previously saw, and um, we're going to just keep using this result, we previously saw that um, the average force, F average, was equal to delta P 
the impulse divided by delta t, how long it took to deliver that impulse. And in this case, um, we're interested in the magnitude of this average force. Now, when we see delta p on top, we recognize that's a vector. But when we see delta t on the bottom, that's an amount of time. That's not a vector. That's a scalar quantity. So we should uh, realize that all we have to do to get the magnitude of uh, the average force is take the magnitude of delta p and then divide out delta t. OK, so delta p, um, as we found earlier, the magnitude of that was 3.8. 748 to 3 sig figs kilograms meters per second. And then we divided out the time. Uh, we're going to divide out the time, that is, which is 74.5 milliseconds, or 74.5 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds. By the way, it's really important to convert to seconds in this step because we want to combine the units of seconds here and here. So we want the same unit, in other words. Now, when you make this calculation, you get uh, 52.01. We'd keep three sig figs in this case. And kilograms, meters per second squared, if you think about the units, just like before, are how the units come out. So again, round it to 52.0, the three sig figs. The units are newtons. That is the magnitude of the force. So on average, the, the, the board is delivering 52 newtons of force to the ball while it's in contact. But again, that only lasts for a really short amount of time. Well, what about the angle? What direction is this force being exerted? Well, we already have the answer. We know the direction of the delta p vector, and we know that the average force is just the delta p vector divided by a scalar, some amount of time. And that implies that the average force Let's just write this. F average and delta P are in the same direction. Okay, so that's really important to note. Well, what was that direction? It was 134.0 degrees off the positive x axis. So now we've also got the magnitude and direction of the average force. There it is. All right, so next we have a question for the class. Now, it, it really deals with the same sort of situation. There's, there's a bounce uh, of a ball off of a wall. And what we want to do is get some sense of what the, uh, the force that is involved in this situation is. Um, but this is a little bit more conceptual, OK? We, we don't really want to make any kind of detailed calculations. We just want to make a comparison of two different cases. So. Consider the two scenarios shown below. In both cases, we have a one kilogram ball, which is thrown towards a wall, and it hits the wall going 15 meters per second, and it bounces off 56 milliseconds later with the same exact speed. Now, the question is, in which scenario does the wall exert a larger force on the ball? Explain why. So let's look at these two cases. In case A, um, the, the ball hits the wall close to head on. There's a very small angle it makes. Uh, on the other hand, um, if we look at case B, it, it hits the wall at a much larger angle, uh, much less close to head on. So let's try to figure out which one of these cases involves a bigger amount of force that the uh, wall is exerting on the ball. OK, so in this example, what we have just like in the other two examples, is a ball that is bouncing off of a wall. So I'm going to label uh, a few things on the diagram here uh, that weren't shown on the slide. Um, for one, we have a vector here, which I'm going to label p initial. That just means the momentum of the ball just before it strikes the wall. And similarly, p final up here, that's the momentum of the ball just after it bounces off. Now, these two vectors have a certain angle theta that they make with this line right here. And the way you want to think about this uh, horizontal dash line is it's perpendicular to the wall itself. So in other words, these angles theta tell you what kind of angle my momentum vectors make with this perpendicular line. So 
If I want to get a sense of how large the force involved in this bounces, um, I know that delta P is a very helpful uh, concept because the larger the change in momentum, the larger the force. That's really what it's going to boil down to. So we want to know in which case is there a larger change in momentum, which, by the way, is P final minus P initial. So I want to do this one graphically. I want to just show you with a diagram uh, which is the larger force. And basically, with delta P, what we have is a subtraction of vectors. And I know that I can draw a tip-to-tail diagram if I'm adding two vectors. So I can change this real easily into P final plus negative P initial, so that it's basically just like vector addition, right? If I take P final and negative P initial, and I connect them tip-to-tail, that will give me some kind of visual sense as to what delta P is, and therefore what the force is. So the first thing I need to draw is P final. Well, that's again the momentum after bouncing off the wall, and that appears to be going up and to the left in the second quadrant. So right there is a P final vector. Let's also note that it makes a certain angle theta with respect to that um, perpendicular line right there. The next thing is negative P initial. So we're not adding P initial, which is uh, in the first quadrant up into the right. We're adding negative P initial. So remember that to take a negative of a vector, it's the same exact vector you started with, but just flip it around 180 degrees. So instead of pointing uh, up into the right, it should be pointing down into the left in the third quadrant to give us negative P initial. So there's P final tip to tail with negative P initial. Um, okay, let's also note uh, that we have an angle to label when it comes to P initial. Um, this is the same angle theta up here uh, that we see in the diagram. And also, this angle, because we have alternate interior angles, is also equal to theta. Now I'm going to draw the resultant vector, which is what I get when I um, add these two together tip to tail. Again, that's delta P. So I hope by looking at this, it's pretty clear that if my angle gets smaller, okay, since P initial and P final are the same size, the length of these arrows is the same, all that we're really changing is the angle theta. If the angle theta gets smaller, then delta P gets bigger, okay? So if theta is smaller, delta P is bigger, So we get a bigger change in momentum. And we know that if the delta P increases, so does the force. So the answer as to which one of these two pictures involves a bigger force, it's the one where the angle theta is smaller. And this should make intuitive sense because I don't know about you, but if I, if I were to have to run headfirst into a wall I would rather hit it at kind of a glancing angle than hit it head on where the angle is smaller because I know that I'm going to feel more force uh, if I hit the wall closer to head on. That's the same idea here. So which was the case where we had a smaller angle and it was closer to head on? Well, that was case A. So case A has the bigger force in those two We've covered a few things uh, so far. We've defined what momentum is. We've discussed how momentum is related to force and how that is a useful idea. It can tell you, for instance, you know, when a, something bounces off something else very quickly, there is some amount of force involved in that, and we can actually make a calculation. Um, now let's get into kind of the heart of this chapter, which is conservation of momentum. This is a really important idea in physics, uh, so let's get into that. Now... This is actually our first uh, example of a conservation law that we've come across in Physics 44. So let's really take a step back and talk generally about what a conservation law is and uh, why it's so powerful in physics. So in a basic sense, a conservation law is just any kind of law that states 
that there's some quantity, there's some number that doesn't change. Even as a system evolves over time, there's a certain number that doesn't change. As long as you have that, you have a conservation law. So that's pretty broad, that's pretty abstract. Let's take a look at an example. So there was a, a French chemist um, named Antoine Lavoisier who lived in the uh, 1700s. And what he did is he demonstrated that when you have a chemical reaction, you mix up some chemicals in a beaker, that mass is conserved. So even though there could be a lot of complicated things going on in this chemical reaction, uh, all kinds of interesting changes happening, what doesn't change is the total mass. So if I mix two things together in a beaker, even if they undergo a chemical reaction, the total mass of those reacting chemicals is not changing. Okay, so that's what we call conservation of mass. Um, there are tons of other examples that come up in physics, uh, just to name a few. There's this idea of conservation of energy, which we'll talk about a little bit um, in this class, but really get uh, a fully fleshed out picture in physics 45, and uh, conservation of momentum, which is what we're going to talk about here. Now, conservation laws, the, again, these statements that um, there's a certain quantity that doesn't change over time, these are really powerful ideas in physics because A, usually the most concise and straightforward way to think about a problem is in terms of conservation laws. And, and B, um, conservation laws really tell you what is and what isn't possible in nature. So if I think about some situation where, uh, let's say in a chemical reaction, mass is conserved, I know at least that's possible. Um, if I think about another situation where mass is not conserved in a chemical reaction, well, I just can rule that out entirely, right? It's, it's just not possible. It violates a really fundamental law of physics. So um, that's a little bit about conservation laws. Now, we're building up to something called conservation of momentum, but um, we're, we're not quite ready to go there just yet. So in order to really understand conservation of momentum, what we need to do is, is a little bit of a shift in thinking. And what we're gonna to start to think about is systems of particles. Okay, we need to know how to analyze a system of particles. So that's a pretty broad uh, concept when we say a system of particles. Now, quite literally, what I want you to think of is just any number of particles that can be moving around in any kind of complicated way but we're trying to consider all of those particles together. We wanna to look at all of them together as a single system. So let me give you a couple examples just to get you uh, kind of thinking about what this means. Um, well, one example of a system of particles that we could have is just any collection of atoms that are bound together in, in an object. So let's say we have a baseball bat. A baseball bat is a system of particles because it's just a big collection of atoms that are all bound together, they're all connected uh, to make that object. So that's just a really big system of particles. That's one way we can think about a baseball bat or really any other kind of solid object. Um, another example is maybe you have a bunch of objects that are not bound together, like the atoms that make up a baseball bat. Uh, and so an example of this would be Maybe we have a bunch of different billiard balls um, colliding on a pool table. So take a look at this animation. Again, I can think of all of those uh, billiard balls that are moving on the pool table as a system of particles. Okay, and there are just any number of other examples, but hopefully you kind of get the general idea of what this is talking about. All right, so, so now that we have this idea of a system of particles, um, the next thing we need to really get a, a sense of is the difference between internal and external forces, okay? So whenever we're dealing with a system of particles, whatever the, the case may be, um, it's usually a good idea to draw something on your diagram called a system boundary. And really, it's just a uh, kind of circle or box around the system you're studying. So it's really clear what's inside the system and what's outside. So if we take a look at the bottom of the page, I have a little uh, diagram shown here. Uh, well, what's going on? It looks like there are two people standing on a board and they are both pulling on a rope. 
uh, at either end. Then there's a person pulling that board um, and moving those two people. So if we define the system to be the board and then the two people standing on the board, um, then we can draw that system boundary around uh, that system. Now the person on the outside who's pulling on the board is outside of the system. So that's the idea. Okay, so let, let's get into this idea of internal and external forces. Internal forces are any force uh, that is exerted between particles in the same system. And external forces are anything that uh, is exerted from something outside of the system. So, so let's take a look. Let's say we've got these two people uh, who are standing on the wooden board. And again, they're, they're holding a rope and they're pulling on it. So the force of tension in that rope would be considered an internal force because it's exerted between two objects in the system. Okay. Now the person uh, pulling on the rope to move the board um, would be considered an external force because that's exerted by something that is outside of the system. So that's really the difference between an internal and external force. Okay. An internal force is exerted between two objects in the same system, an external force is coming from something outside of the system. Okay. So, um, with that said, we have a really important result to look at here, uh, which is the following. This equation at the top of the page says, the sum of all external forces acting on a system is equal to dp dt. Let's take a uh, closer look at that equation, what it means. So on the left side, what we have is the net external force acting on the system. So think of adding up all of the external forces that act on the system. That's what appears on the left-hand side. What appears on the right-hand side is the time rate of change of the total momentum of the system. So in other words, the derivative of momentum with respect to time. This is just a statement that those two things are equal. And if we think about what this means, this is just telling us that really the only way we can change the momentum of a system is if an external force acts on it. So we need an outside force acting on the system to change the momentum of that system. Now, I do give a derivation for this equation in the notes, but for now, I just wanna kinda of take a look at it and um, explain what it means. Okay, so if it takes an external force to change the momentum of a system, if that's what the equation at the top of the screen says, then we can look at the implications of this. Um, so let's think about the situation where the net external force acting on a system is actually zero. Okay, so there is no external force overall acting on the system. Well, that means the left-hand side is equal to zero, that, that sum of external forces is equal to zero. But that implies that the right-hand side is also equal to zero, that dp dt is equal to zero. Now, let's think about this. If the time rate of change of the momentum of your system is equal to zero, that just means the momentum isn't changing, right? Whenever the, the derivative of, an, uh, of a quantity is zero, that just means that quantity is not changing. In other words, what we can say is the total momentum of the system is conserved. It doesn't change over time. One way we typically write this is P initial is equal to P final. Another way of thinking about that is just the momentum is not changing. Initial and final values are the same. It's not changing over time. Okay, so to recap, if we have a system with no external force acting on it, then momentum for that system is going to be conserved. That's the idea. That's conservation of momentum. So the first thing is, uh, let's, let's look at a really simple example of how we can use conservation of momentum. Now, the simplest kind of system we can look at is just a single object that's moving. So let's, let's not make it more complicated than it needs to be. Let's just think about one object that's moving. In this case, um, let's think about a spaceship that's moving through space at some kind of velocity. Okay, so we said earlier that if we have a system with 
zero external force acting on it in total, um, then the momentum of that system is going to be conserved. So if our system is just this spaceship, and we say there's no outside force acting on the spaceship, that means the momentum, which is m times v, is not changing. It's conserved. It's constant over time. Well, the mass of the spaceship is not something that's going to be changing. So that tells us that the velocity of the spaceship is also something that's not going to be changing if m times v is going to stay the same. So let, let's think about what we have here. We have a spaceship moving through space. There's no external force acting on it. And that directly implies by conservation of momentum that the spaceship should just be moving with a constant velocity. I want you to think about where we've seen this before. This is really equivalent to Newton's first law of motion. Remember that Newton's first law of motion says, an object will move at constant velocity unless it is acted upon by an unbalanced force. Okay, so this is really the same thing as conservation of momentum for a single object because we have no outside force acting on it and that directly implies that it's going to be moving at a constant velocity. That's the idea. Okay, so before we get into a conservation of momentum problem, again, I want to really stick to the conceptual issues here. Um, it's, it's a little bit tricky to start thinking about systems of particles in defining a system. So I do want to get into a few examples of that. So conservation of momentum, it only applies when there is zero external force acting on a system. Okay, so only if we have a system with zero external force acting on it, can we actually use conservation of momentum. It's a really important point, which means if, if we're doing a problem, we really need to clearly define what the system we're analyzing is before we try to even apply conservation of momentum to it. So here's an example I want you to think about. We've got two pool balls, uh, two pool balls colliding on a table. And let's assume uh, for simplicity that there's no friction here. Okay, so, so let's look at the, uh, the situation. In the initial state, we have the 12 ball moving to the right towards the 11 ball, and the 11 ball starts off at rest. But then they collide with each other, the balls uh, hit each other. And in the final state, after they collide, uh, we have the 12 ball, which is now at rest, and the 11 ball is moving off to the right. So that's, that's the situation we're looking at, just a really simple collision between two pool balls on a table. Now, <clears throat> we could analyze this using conservation of momentum, but we have to be really careful about how we do that. So <clears throat> one way we could define the system is to say the system I want to look at is just the 11 ball. So let's draw a little red box around that to say that's the system we're looking at. Now, obviously, if we choose this as our system, momentum is not conserved because, well, let's look at the initial state. The 11 ball is not moving, so it has no momentum. And the final state, it is moving to the right, so it has momentum. So obviously the momentum has changed, right? Started off zero, and then it ended up with some non-zero momentum. And the reason momentum did not stay the same and conservation of momentum doesn't work here is because there's an outside force acting on that system. What is it? Well, the 12 ball hit and exerted a force on the 11 ball. So there was an outside force there. Uh, that's why conservation of momentum didn't work. But if we define the system to be the 11 ball and the 12 ball together, then uh, momentum is conserved. Then we can actually use conservation of momentum. And let me show you exactly what this looks like on the next slide. Okay, so if we define the system here as the 12 ball and the 11 ball together, and again, we're ignoring friction or air resistance uh, when we think of this example, um, then conservation of momentum actually works and we can use it. And to really see why, let's get into a little bit of an analysis of the forces that are involved in this situation. So what do we have? The first thing I could think of is there's a weight acting on the 12 ball. I'm going to label that as WE2, uh, which is just a downward facing vector. The next thing we have is 
When the balls are colliding with each other, when they're actually in contact, they exert forces on each other. And the, the 11 ball exerts a force on the 12 ball going to the left. And I'm going to label that force as F12. So just whatever force the 11 ball exerts on the 12 ball, that's what you see there going to the left. Of course, these balls are sitting on a table of some kind, and there's a normal force from that table. Let's call that N. T2, the normal force that the table exerts on the, uh, the 12 ball. And then we can label the same set of forces on the 11 ball. Of course, there's the weight. Uh, there is a normal force from the table also exerted on the 11 ball. And um, this is really important. The 12 ball is exerting a force on the 11 ball to the right uh, during this collision. And by Newton's third law of motion, we know that these forces are equal and opposite. So F12 is equal and opposite to uh, F21. So those are the forces that we need to consider in this uh, collision. So let's think about in this system, which forces are internal and which forces are external. Well, remember internal forces are forces that two objects in your system exert on each other. So since the 11 and the 12 ball are objects in our system, F12 and F21 would be considered internal forces. On the other hand, we have everything else that you see as an external force because the table is not in our system and the earth is not in our system. The table exerts the normal forces on these balls and the earth exerts the force of gravity or the weight. So those would be considered external forces. Okay, so all of the uh, remaining forces, the two normal forces and the two weights are external to the system. Now let's think about if I add up all of those external forces, if I take the net external force on the system, uh, what do I get? Well, I'll have NT2, I have to add that to WE2, I have to add that to NT1, and then I have to add that to WE1. Can we think about how these forces add together? Well, I think it's pretty clear that if we look at the normal force on ball two and the weight, that those two cancel out. Those two vertical forces just cancel each other out. And it's actually the same deal for the 11 ball, right? The, the, the two vertical forces, normal force and weight, cancel each other out. So actually what we're dealing with is a situation where the total external force, the net external force acting on the system is zero. And because of that, well, momentum is conserved. We, we saw that earlier, that if we have a system where there is zero outside force acting on it, then the total momentum of that system is gonna be conserved. So we're gonna end it here uh, for this part of the lecture. And when we come back, we're gonna get into some problems where we actually uh, use conservation of momentum to predict how things move after they collide. So just like this example, we know we can use conservation of momentum. How does that actually look um, when we solve a problem? So I will see you next time. And uh, in the meantime, be safe, be healthy. Take care.